This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Especially a very warm welcome to Mulhopper Montessori from Florida. Welcome to Juma in the Sabi Sands, where it is a beautiful 24 degrees Celsius, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It is wonderful out here in the Sabi Sands. My name is Steve Falkenridge. I'm joined on camera by Senzom Gize, and we are indeed in the African savannah. All around us are wild animals and plants and habitats to talk about. So please send through your questions and your comments with your teacher. Let us know what you'd like to discuss, what you already know, and uh, what's happening. We'd love to be interactive with you. And we are on Bushwalk this afternoon, and we're going to go see if we can track down a male leopard from this morning who is walking around somewhere over there. So we're going to go see if we can find his tracks on the ground, because that's how you find a leopard, with the tracks on the ground. And you also, you also have to listen very carefully, because there's lots of animals, like birds, and a small antelope that will shout at the leopard when they see it because the leopard likes to eat meat. So we're going to be, have to be very careful. Jump on board. Come with us. We're going to be walking. Very important when we walk. We keep quiet. We don't make a lot of noise. We walk in a single file, one after the other. And it's important to have a lot of enthusiasm. Okay, someone who is the most enthusiastic member of the team would like to say good afternoon. Hello to all of you who have just joined us. It's so great to have you on my safari vehicle. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Sebastian. And we are driving around hoping to find some animals. Now, we haven't got any animals just yet, but that's because you've got to go looking for the animals when you're on a safari. And it's a very, well, it's been quite a warm day, even though I've got a jersey on when we're driving, there's a little bit of a nip in the wind. so. Because it's been so warm, I'm thinking that a lot of the animals are going to get quite thirsty today. So I'm going to go and find a spot where they can go for a bit of a drink. And the first area that I'm going to go and check is an area called Chitwa Dam. It's a little bit away from here in that direction over there. And there, I can promise you, I'll show you some hippos. I'll be able to show you lots of birds. I'm sure I'll be able to show you some impala. Who knows what else will be around there maybe even a leopard or a lion will come down for a drink or my favorite animal a big herd of elephants that will be the ultimate goal so that's where we're gonna go is a little bit further south so at the moment we are traveling southwest and uh, I think it, I'm trying to think how long it should take us I don't actually know I suppose it depends how fast you drive how long it will take us to get there and who knows maybe we see something else on the way so we'll keep looking. Conrad, now you've asked what birds could you find in the African savannah? Lots and lots of different types of birds, but some of the ones we might see when we get down to Chitwa Dam, um, just at the watering hole, um, let's talk about those ones so you can get excited. There's a big African fish eagle, they're beautiful. And then you could also maybe see something like I'm just checking the footprints on the floor and you could also see some Egyptian goose and maybe some fork-tailed drongos and an African darter some helmeted guinea fowl those are funny looking birds they've got blue heads and their feathers are black with white little polka dots on them <gasps> look at that look at this big guy now this is another animal that we're going to see down at Chitwa Dam this is called a water buck and he's not too big just yet. Now, I know that this is a boy because he's got horns on his head. You can see that? The girls don't have any horns. And the boys get much bigger than the girls too. But he's still got a bit of growing to do. And they're very easy to spot. Because if you look closely, you can see that this, this antelope has got a heart on its nose. You see that? <laughs> look how it wiggles it. We're lucky he didn't run away. Sometimes they get a bit nervous. <laughs> and he's got a long tongue too. Now they like to hang around water, so I definitely think that they'll be around at some point. But he's all on his own. He must be very careful. 
because I'm pretty sure I heard a leopard making a bit of noise in this area and we couldn't find him. You can see all those flies now bothering him, trying to get into his eyes. Oh, now I was telling you about leopards that were heard in this area. It seems as though Steve has found some big paw prints from, I don't know if it's going to be a hyena, a leopard or a lion. Well, boys and girls, have you ever seen a leopard before? We're going to start off by showing you the track in the sand of a big male leopard. Look down here. Here we go. We've got two feet. There's one foot and the other foot. Let's start with this one, shall we? Can you see how it's got these toes? There's one toe there, two toes, three toes, and four toes. Okay, very characteristic of dogs and cats, but what cats have at the back, can you see how there's three over here? What we call lobes at the back of the foot. One, two, and three. Can you see that? Okay, so there's definitely a cat, and it is quite big. If I put my, my knife over here, you'll see that that is... 10 centimeters in size so that is not enormous so it's not a lion 10 centimeters would say is a leopard a male leopard in fact and by the fact that the pad over here is there and the toe look how wide the toe is you would definitely say that's a male because males are much bigger than females see how wide that is over there females are are narrow and quite sort of gentle very small feet so this is the front foot of a male leopard and here is the back foot and um, very interesting because the way cats walk is when they walk very quietly they'll put their back foot on top of their front foot have you seen a leopard stalking called leopard crawling where they walk very slowly forward like this back foot on front and this leopard is walking pretty quickly because that foot is quite far ahead of the front foot so very beautiful track in the sand and it is going in that direction so these are probably the tracks of the male that we want to find you. So we're going to get up, we're going to start walking, and we're going to see if we can find some more tracks further down the road. Ah. Well, I wonder if you've seen a leopard before, have you? Let me know. Hello Camden, you want to know what kind of meat leopards eat? Well, leopards will eat any meat that they want, any meat that they can get their, get their hands on, or their teeth on, should I say. Before I answer your question, you can actually see that the leopard has walked here. Can you see his tracks there? There he stepped again. There's his front foot underneath and his back foot is on top. And look how he's walked this way. And he's done a typical leopard movement. I'm going to demonstrate it myself. He's walked into the bush. He's walked into the bush like this. He's rubbed his face like that. And then he's turned his bottom and then he sprays. A little bit of urine because he owns this place this is his land okay so that's what he's done he's walked down he's spread so when you're following a leopard that scent marking he's probably gonna walk quite far and quite fast so we're gonna have to walk very quickly if we're gonna catch up with him but Camden you want to know what meat they eat they'll eat any meat they can get but generally they like sort of between here sort of scrub hairs Dacre Impala and even baby kudu or water buck. I'm sure we'll get to find you a couple of those. Taylor's going down to a watering hole. She's definitely going to get to see one of them. They also eat monkeys and squirrels and birds. Whatever they can get their hands on, really. They are meat eaters. So you want to know why leopards have spots? Well, first of all, the reason they have spots is all about camouflage. So the spots, for example, if we looked at just this little patch here of grass, the spots, if the leopard lay right over here, it would be invisible. It would just disappear in the undergrowth. So when it's walking through grass like this, when it wants to catch some of its favorite food, it has to go very flat. And when the animal looks at it, it can't see it unless it moves. So it's all about camouflage. The spots make it disappear. It makes it look like leaves and look like the shadows in the grass. So it's all about camouflage. Um, the jaguar has also got the same sort of spots. Cheetah as well. It's all about trying to get as close as they possibly can to the animal before quickly coming forward and catching them. Because the animals are very fast. 
very, very fast. So the leopard has to get very close before it can launch a very fast lightning attack. And if it doesn't get close, an animal sees it, the leopard will just, will just walk away and pretend it doesn't want to eat them. Just walk away. Back into the bushes where it will disappear again into the, into the wilderness. What we have over here, everybody, and hello especially to the kids at the Montessori school. You know, I went to a Montessori school. So did I. So did Fergus, who's on camera. My name is James. It's lovely to have you with us. And let's get straight into the animals. You know how to ask questions now. We've got a wart. Ooh, look what's hiding in the bushes just in front of us there. We've got a warthog. Look at that. Isn't that nice? So that's a big pig, and walking in front of the big pig is something called a nyala. And a nyala is my favourite antelope out here. I think they're very special indeed. Just because their colours are so pretty. Now that warthog is looking at us as interestedly as we're looking at him. Andrew, the answer to that question is probably not when we talk about the big animals. So we've got lots of big animals here, like impala and the nyala and the leopards and the lions and all those sorts of mammals. So I think we've seen and discovered all of the mammals that we're going to out here. But there could easily be a butterfly species or a grasshopper or a dragonfly or a termite type of, you know, a type of one of those animals that we don't know yet. And so it's quite, and remember those are still animals. So I think we've discovered all of the big mammals like these ones here, but it's possible that there's still an insect or a spider that we haven't managed to identify yet. It's a really good question, but it's also important to remember that when we talk about animals, we're talking about birds and reptiles and mammals and insects and arachnids, spiders and scorpions and ticks and all that sort of thing. So when you think about all of those things, it's quite possible that there's a small thing like that that we may not find or we may not know yet. Now we're going to leave this group of animals and move across this way because Steve was showing you those footprints of the leopard there on the, tra the tracks on the road and we're going to see if we don't get very lucky and find this leopard around here. In the meantime we're going over a very dry water hole. Taylor's managed to find a lot of water. Sorry, I, <laughs> I was just hearing lots and lots of uh, chattering. I think our volumes are a bit loud. Look how cool this is. There's a hippo, a big mother hippo, and her baby, and also an Egyptian goose. That's the big bird that's standing to the right of the baby. And then the little birds on top of mom, those are called oxpeckers. Now how crazy is that? Two hippos and two different kinds of birds. And then also just in that scene, if you take your eyes to the left of mom, you'll see that there's a big gray thing. There's a couple of big grey things, and I'm not talking about the hippo. Those are terrapins that are just at the back there. So like water tortoises, really. You might know them as turtles, but here in South Africa, we call them terrapins. Now, this is very, very nice to see. And that baby is fine. That baby is probably just sleeping. Because it's winter now, it's not very, very hot. So these hippos like to sit out in the suntan. And the little baby probably wanted to do the same thing, but you can see that mom was standing and casting a shadow. This one is too big to hide behind someone's shadow, so it needs to use the tree shadow. Fast asleep. So this is normal to see, and you're really lucky. You normally only see this in this area in the winter months, which is quite cool. And the sun's just perfect for them to lay out like that. And there's a whole lot. And that's a lodge in the background, so you can go and stay there on safari. This is called Chitwa Chitwa here in the Sabi sand in South Africa. It's a very nice place. You can have your cocktails, your parents can have their cocktails. You can sit out here with your juice and you can have your breakfast. How cool is that? Some tea, hot chocolate. Oh, we make good hot chocolate here in South Africa. The best hot chocolate you've ever tasted, especially when you're out on safari on a cold, <laughs> on a very cold morning. And you can watch the hippos. 
And there's the rest of them, all just sleeping there. Clara, now this is actually this is a type of dam that we got here. This isn't quite a lake. It's so big though; it should be a lake, <laughs> lake chitwa chitwa, but it actually it's all man-made here. So there's there's lots and lots of different types of lakes throughout Africa, but in this area here, in this water, there are hippos, there are lots of crocodiles, there are plenty of fish, and then there's lots of birds. <coughs> Excuse me. Woo. Thank you. There are lots and lots of different types of birds. And then because all the animals need to drink water, most of them every single day, this is a good spot. So you'll see water buck, you'll see impala, you'll see all sorts of crazy things coming down here to have a drink of water. So it's a very, very good area. But everybody's very, everyone's sort of very sleepy this afternoon. They're not doing too much, except that Egyptian goose. The Egyptian goose is the most exciting thing there. It's having a bath. You see that? It's washing itself now. And dipping underneath. How cool is that? Oh, wow. You go, Egyptian goose. Wonderful. Well, we're going to keep going and uh, park, I think, up on the dam wall. But it seems as though James has found another cat. We have got so very lucky, everybody. Look, there's a beautiful leopard. The same, not the same one that Steve was showing you the footprints of. This is a different one. I'm just going to get into a nice position where we can have a look at her. She's going to walk past us over here, and we're all going to talk nice and quietly. So talk nice and quietly in your classroom. Make sure that she doesn't hear you making a noise. This is a beautiful leopard, and her name is Tandy. She's a mother leopard. She's got a little baby around here. He's just eight months old. She's just eight months old. Eli, lions and leopards just have to get wet when it rains, you know. They don't really have a choice. They can't go and find a sheltered spot to go. There we go. So they just have to get wet and they don't mind that, you know. Sometimes, especially in the rainy season here, it's so very hot that they don't mind getting a little bit wet. Now, what I'm really hoping is that she's going to lead us to her little baby, whose name is Tlalamba. It's going to get very thick in this little part here. That means the bush is going to get thick, so there'll be a bit of noise from the bush. We'll just try and get into a position where we can see her nicely. There's a little road that goes around here. There she comes. Let's park so we can see her nicely. Can you see her, folks? She's just along this along this path here. There we go. See there? Oh, sorry. There we go. Just down this path. Isn't that special? Now this cat, we don't see all the time. I mean, we're very lucky because we see her fairly regularly, but you know, leopards are rare. And so to have a lovely view of a cat like this on, this, on an afternoon like this is very special indeed. We're very lucky. I hope you guys feel lucky. Isn't she beautiful? So that's Tandi, which means the loved one. Which I think is a wonderful name for a leopard. Now she's just thinking, where should I go? Should I go and try and catch something else? She ate a rabbit this morning for breakfast. She and her daughter, Chalamba, shared a rabbit for breakfast. But a rabbit's not very much 
for something like a leopard. And so it's quite possible that she's going to try and get something else. Often leopards will only eat once every two days or sometimes once every two or three days. But a rabbit, well, she's going to be a bit hungry after her rabbit breakfast. And so is her baby. And so I think basically what she's doing now is she's out shopping for herself and for her baby. Looking around, listening, smelling all the time. Eli, cheetahs are much faster than leopards. We sometimes see cheetahs here, not as often as we see leopards. And they are the fastest animals in the whole world. And they're so fast because that is how they catch their prey. So some of their prey include the Thompson's gazelle, which lives up in East Africa. And the Thompson's gazelle is the fastest antelope, or the fastest herbivore in the world, as far as I'm aware. Certainly in Africa. And if you want to eat the Thompson's gazelle, well, you've got to be really, really fast. And so that's why the cheetahs are so fast. And what a leopard does is it doesn't have to be quite as fast because it's very good at hiding. So it gets into some thick bush and it waits to see. It waits for its prey to walk past. And when its prey walks past, then it jumps out and grabs it. And that's called ambush. Isn't she lovely? What a special cat that is. She's one of our very favourite cats, this. And I'm just hoping that she's going to take us to her baby. I tell you, I'm not sure that she's going to, because I suspect what she's going to do is wait until she's caught something else to eat before she goes back to little Tlalamba, who's a very naughty girl, but she's very special. Always hungry is Tlalamba. Well, I'm not going to move anywhere from here. We're going to sit with this beautiful cat. In the meantime, Taylor has got a big, loud, noisy animal. We do, but they're being very quiet this afternoon. But there are some birds that are being very noisy. So remember how I said to you that the birds that are running around on top of the hippos are called ox peckers. I didn't really tell you anything about them. Now they're very cool birds and uh, they have to help the animals, which is quite nice. So the hippos and the zebra and the impala and the kudu, they all have to learn to live with these birds because in the beginning, they're a little bit annoying. And Liz, you were wondering about these birds too. So basically what they do you can just see they're using the hippos like rocks at the moment, but they'll also jump around in them and you'll see them digging in their ears and around their tails. And what they're doing is that they're trying to find some ticks, which are parasites. So they suck the blood of the animals and that's what the oxpeckers like to eat. They're actually feeding on blood. So they're like vampire birds, is like I always like to describe them. And then the other thing is, is that hippos, shame, they often fight with one another, so they get cuts on their bodies really, really easily. Now, because those birds like to feed on blood, sometimes they're a little bit naughty. And you know, like if you fall and you scrape your knee and your knee gets a scab on it, those oxpeckers will try and pick open those scabs on the, on the hippos and then make that blood come out again. And then they'll, they'll drink it, basically. But they're not doing that at the moment. I can't see anybody that's got any big cuts just yet. But I think they're also just enjoying the sun. Now, normally you see the hippos in the water. Oh, Sebastian, the baby has just stood up. Remember that little baby that we saw sleeping? It's just got up. Look how tiny it is. Look how big mom is. That is a brand new hippo. That is so small. That can't be more than a week old. Wow. Look at it. 
And now, to me, that is the cutest animal in the whole world. Kennedy, I suppose, yes, hippos do eat one of the same things that elephants like to eat, and their favorite thing to eat is grass. Now, elephants actually also like to eat grass when it's around, and um, the hippos are the best at grazing. Look at those big square mouths. They're like a lawnmower. They can go around and gobble up all the grass. But sometimes, like now, because we're heading into winter, there's not a lot of rain. Sometimes there's no rain for months, and all the grass is drying up. So now these hippos are having to walk very, very far to try and find something to eat. But that little hippo won't be eating any grass just yet. It'll be drinking mom's milk, and then sometimes what you might see it doing, and I think that's what it's maybe doing now, it could be eating mom's poop. That could, that could definitely be happening. Or somebody else's poop, maybe some elephant poop. Sometimes they're known to do that too. And it's actually good if this little one does eat some, some of mom's poop. And the reason why I say that is because there's all sorts of special things in mom's stomach that will help that little one build up the correct bacteria to be able to fight off any diseases and things like that. Any, well, all sorts of wonderful things. I'm trying to think of the most simple way to explain that. <laughs> but that is very, very cool. You're so lucky to see a baby, almost brand new hippo out of the water. Now they're all very happy that you're here watching them. Do you hear them? <laughs> Well, they're making lots and lots of noise. How nice is that? That's a great sound, don't you think? They're all laughing. So who told a funny joke in the classroom? Because I think that's what they're laughing at. Now, I think we'll sit here for a little bit longer. Off you go back to James with that beautiful spotted cat. Well, this spotted cat is now very tired. She's having a bit of a snooze. And, of course, most cats like to snooze during the day. She's mostly active when it's just after sunset and just before sunrise. And so to find her walking like we did was quite lucky. I think probably she was having a drink. There's a little water hole not far from where we found her, and I'm sure she was having a drink there. But she'll be all alert, and although she's lying down, if anything comes past here that she could eat, she'll jump on it and eat it. Well, Andrew, that's a good question, and I'm not sure that I've ever thought about it too carefully before. I think the reason that leopards have ears that size, or one of the reasons, is that it's much easier for them to hide their faces so if a leopard, for example, wants to hide and wants to keep its face up, or its face from being seen by predator, by prey, then what she needs to do, I'm just going to talk very quietly as she comes close by, what she needs to do is lift her head up so that her eyes can see. But if she's got great big ears, like a rabbit, for example, then her prey will see her. So what she does is she flattens her little ears against her head and then lifts up her head. Oh, that's very special. Okay, let's move. Oof. Let's see if we can get a nice view. Well, Lillian, that's also a very good question, and this one I definitely know the answer to. The reason that lions have manes is so that they can fight with each other. Lions like to fight with each other. Uh, sorry, Vivian, not Lillian. Lions like to fight with each other. And what that mane does is protect the lion from other lions. It's big and it's hairy around the neck where the lion is most vulnerable. That means where the lion really doesn't want to be bitten. Because if you get bitten on the neck, well, you can bleed to death. And so the lions have got that big, thick mane to protect them from being eaten. And the other reason is to attract females. So lady lions, mummy lions, find big male lions with big beards, big manes, very attractive. I just need to talk on the radio very quickly. Afternoon tax, we've got Tandi mobile towards Giraffe Crossing. She's just south of Central. Yeah, 
let's stop and wait here. It's doing. That's beautiful. All right, it's going to get a little bit rough as we drive through here. So go back and find out what Steve's looking for on foot. Yeah, she's... Well, how is that for an afternoon to start with the leopard? As we're walking further away after my little discussion with you about what leopards do, we started hearing in pilots shouting and shouting and shouting. And yes, we called James and he rushed over and found Tandy, the beautiful leopard. And here is another animal that likes to shout at leopards. This is a nyala. It's a big male nyala. You see those big horns? And he's also got a form of camouflage. It's not spots. He's got a spot on his face, though, and a few on the back of his leg. But other than that, he's got some stripes, and that also helps him to get very camouflaged. He likes to hide away from the leopards and the lions. And he's busy looking at us now, saying, You can't see me, can you? And he just moves the ears so he can hear everything that's going on around. So that is how they protect themselves. They stand very, very still, so as not to be found. But they feed on leaves, and they like to be in, in these sort of dense thicket areas where there's lots of grass that you can see is busy chewing. Like a cow or a sheep, they will eat lots of food, and then they will vomit it back into their mouth where they will chew it again, and then swallow it again. It's a very good adaptation for animals. It allows them to to get the most out of their food. There we go, he's just swallowed it. He's walking very gently. And now his protection, as I said, against lions and leopards is to stand very still. And now what he likes to eat on is grass as well as trees. And I've got a little tree over here that's got its own protection against animals like the Nyala. Got its own protection, and I don't know if you've got any thorns where you come from, but this little plant over here has got very tasty leaves. Ow! And very sharp thorns. So you've got to be very careful. And then Yala will stick his face in there to feed on those leaves. Can you imagine trying to stick your face in there? I've done it before, and it just hurts. It just makes me bleed. So that is how the tree protects itself against there. The animals very very sharp thorns but very tasty and uh, the end result boys and girls is a little pellet like this after the nyala or the impalas eaten all their food and chewed it and chewed it and chewed it they drop these little pellets and there we go you break it open you can see inside very finely chewed very well broken up so that all the digestion inside takes all of the vitamins out of the food so that they are strong and healthy because if they're not strong and healthy leopards, lions, hyenas will try and catch them so that's what they do, they look for the weakest ones so whenever you're out in the wilderness you have to look as strong as you possibly can Andrew, that is a great question, that antelope the Nyala is the bull, he's got lots of fur, what he actually does when he sees another male Nyala is he actually puffs up his fur, makes himself look about twice as big as he normally is, and um, that is how he avoids fighting with another male. Basically, if, if he looks much bigger than the other male, the other male will leave him alone, and he wins the competition without having to clash those mighty horns against the other one's horns. But if, he, if the other male thinks he's the same size or bigger, then they might fight, they might clash, and those horns are very, very sharp. Very, very sharp. They can stab, they can inflict enormous wounds into the side of an animal. Killing them pretty quickly if the horn does penetrate into the lung. And an animal that needs to kill their prey very silently and very quickly is Tundi. You got it. She's got something, she can see something in this little thicket here, in this little sort of patch of bushes. And if you look carefully at her, she, she's looking at something, I can't see what it is, but she might try and kill it. I've got no idea, maybe it's a small rabbit, another one like she had this morning. Maybe it's a small antelope, like a diker, which is a little, little antelope. 
but you can see that the flies are bugging her. She's very angry with the flies. But she's trying to move slowly closer and closer to whatever it is that she's seen. I can't see what she's seen. She's being very, very patient. So we're going to forward shortly just to see if we can't get a slightly better view. But I think this is a very good view that we have here now. And you can hear they're very quiet all around. One or two birds calling, like the go-away bird, which goes quang. And I can hear a woodpecker going tick, 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 and a little bit of wind blowing through the leaves. But otherwise, it's very silent. Now, whatever she has seen has not seen her, because if it had, she wouldn't be waiting like she is. She's hiding behind this bush, waiting for whatever it is to come closer so that she can grab it. Now we'll know if this thing, whatever it is, is coming closer by how she moves. So if she puts her head further down onto the ground, see her head moving slightly to the right-hand side? Whatever it is is moving from the left to the right. All right, we're not going to go anywhere here, but Taylor's now got something very special at the water. We do, we have all the hippos heading back into the water now, but I'm going to drive away because there's also some elephants that have joined us, but I'm just waiting for them to go and get their position down on the water, and then we will go once they... Sorry everybody, let's just stand by here. Sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure that these elephants had a chance to get their spot to drink first. Sorry everybody, I need to reverse. This is just going to take a little while. Sorry everybody, obviously I have to concentrate, I'm driving on a very, very narrow dam wall. Okay, let's just actually stay here. And there we go, a big herd of elephants have also come down to have a drink, which is lovely. They must be very, very thirsty after a a long day of walking around looking for things to eat beautiful and peaceful there's even a little crocodile Seb mm -hmm. in between these two elephants here you can just see it Look at that, there's a little crocodile too. All the different animals. Now I bet that crocodile was just having some fun in the sun and it got a bit disturbed with all of those elephants moving around. The elephants have to drink lots and lots of water every single day. cool are all those sounds. I hope you can hear them.
It's times like this where you just actually have to sit and enjoy the beautiful animals. It's not often that you get to see so many different types of animals in one spot. Conrad, the most endangered animal in Africa is not any one of these that we're looking at at the moment. There are lots and lots of different animals that are unfortunately endangered. Rhinos, black and white rhinos, pangolins, African wild dogs. There's lots of different creatures out here. Elephants, of course, are definitely around. There's quite a few of them in this area, but unfortunately there's some very nasty people out there who want to kill elephants for their tusks. But we try and keep them nice and safe in this area. You can see these guys are nice and happy and relaxed and they're not worried about us. They know that we're not going to do anything to them. Yeah, all the hippos making noises too. You might even be able to hear the elephants when they scratch themselves as they suck up all the water. He's just standing, having a little... Looks like she's sleeping. Scratching her ear now. Mm -hmm. hmm. Making all sorts of noises from all different ends. I was hoping that these elephants would go in and have a little bit of a swim. But maybe it's not hot enough today for them to have a swim. Just spraying lots of water everywhere. <laughs> Can't even see many of the little babies. They're all hidden underneath all those elephants' legs. <laughs> There's a little one though. Oh, and the smells. Very interesting smells coming from these elephants. It smells very earthy. <laughs> a little bit wobbly on his feet. But thank you to everybody. And thank you to all of you from, well, I suppose all the way across the big wide ocean for coming to join us this afternoon. I think you were lucky with all the different animals that you got to see today. Elephants, leopards, hippos, some birds. Very nice, even a big waterbuck. But... Uh, we hope to have you aboard our safaris again sometime soon. Now, for the rest of you, I am going to be sending you into one of our special broadcasts that we are doing because it seems as though that Tundi is on the hunt with James. Now, Michael, her uh, success rate is probably not that fantastic. It's probably about 2 out of 10 or so, so she'll catch every... 20% of the time that she attacks something. It's walking straight towards her now. We can't move now. It's walking straight towards her, looking towards us. Has no idea. There's a thicket there. Is it just one Nyala, or are there a few of them? It's put its head down. Let's just keep watching carefully. I'm sorry we can't see the leopard. Now the Nyala's turned its back, so she's going to move a bit quicker. We might have to move forward now. There, she's charged. She's got it. She's got it. She's got it. She's got it. She's killed it. Watch your heads. Watch your heads here. Heads here. Unbelievable. Unbelievable stuff. Hold on, everybody. There it is. Here we go. This is going to be quite nasty for some people. I'm sorry. It's going to be a bit troublesome to watch. There we are. She's killing there. Uh, 
Oh, my goodness. She hasn't quite got it in the throat grip, you see. What an unbelievable thing to be seeing. And I'm sure you're all absolutely astounded by what you're seeing here. I'm going to try and move. Can you see? Absolutely phenomenal stuff, everybody. That is a big, big animal for Tundi to kill. It's gonna make that little scrub hair she had for breakfast look like a very small hors d'oeuvre. What's your one? All right, we're gonna just sneak a little bit forward now. simply because I think that the main death throws are over. And what I don't want to do is disturb her so she lets go. How's that, Ferg? Are you right there? Is that okay? Okay, we'll stop here. Well, Tracy, I'm not sure that the Nyala or its family would take it quite the same way but yes absolutely the circle of life at its rawest that's unbelievable all I saw was this cat running and then I saw the flash of the white tail of the poor Nyala I can't believe we've seen this I'm I'm really quite gobsmacked by it Is seriously intense, Jennifer. Absolutely. To have had a leopard kill like that, just unbelievable. Do you see how she managed to get onto the back of the Nyala there? And then she would have had to rip her head round so that she could get a piece of the throat to stop it breathing which she's now managed to do. What a thing to see. So with smaller prey, what they'll normally do is jump on the back and then break the spine. They'll just bite into the spine and break it. But with a big animal like this, she's got to get a chokehold. She's got to suffocate it. Her strength is absolutely phenomenal. She probably weighs in the region of 40 kilograms. It's about a hundred and about a hundred pounds. That Nyala will be double that. Maybe around about 80 kilos or so. At Radislaw, this is a Nyala, not a Kudu. It's a young Nyala, young bull, just changing his colours. And so, as an adult, he would have weighed about 100 kilograms. And I'd say he had about 20 kilograms to go, maybe a bit more, maybe 30 kilograms. But so he's around about double her weight, I think. Yeah, Eliza, this is the first time I've seen a successful leopard hunt from beginning to end. I've seen it often where they've chased and then you get round a bush and they've caught. But we actually saw the takedown. I don't know if you saw it, but we managed to see it from where we were sitting. I'm just going to ask these guys behind us if they can see. Can you see? Do you have a five out of five visual? Four out of five. That will have to do. So if they can see, they're okay.
Sie hat es schaffen. Ich habe just just talking to Texan, who's on the vehicle behind us. He's a, one of the guides here. He says they saw lions killing this morning. So that's very special. Their guests have been very, very lucky indeed. Now, let us pay, as we almost always must, tribute to the Nyala, because what tends to happen in a situation like this is that we revel in the hunting skill of the leopard, as we should. She has done in a magnificent job here. But let's just take a little moment to appreciate the magnificence of the poor old Nyala that she's whacked and give him due respect for his contribution to her life, to Chalamba's life, and of course to the overall ecology of this area. Now, that may sound a little wishy-washy, but I do think it's important because I think I find the I find the actual watching of death quite disturbing. Right, here we go. Now she's got a proper chokehold, which she wanted earlier on. She's just making sure that she really, really gets the chokehold on, and I don't think there's any point, but there it is. Claudine, she will try and move this kill to a place where other predators won't see it. Okay, we're going to sit very still and be very quiet because she can be a little irritated from time to time. And in fact, I'm probably under the bush that she wanted to put her kill under. We're just going to wait here and be very quiet. You saw her just give us a little snarl there. So what she's doing is now selecting a spot to put this kill. Yeah, April, she's a gorgeous cat. She's a cold-hearted killer, though. Just sit nice and still there, Ferg. Nice and still. She might just have something to eat before she goes to fetch the lamb and before she moves it, because it's going to be a very heavy kill for her. reacts to the sound of human voices, this cat. And above you can hear. Nice and still, everybody, nice and still. Miela, Miela. I'm just trying to tell the others to be quiet. She's getting a little bit upset. Squatil and go Just telling Taxon that she's obviously not really happy. Tax doesn't have a great view of her. And I unfortunately can go nowhere here. So we're just going to sit quietly. It's difficult to tell sometimes what irritates them, especially this, this dear kitty, who can tend to be upset for no reason. She's eating off the tail at the moment. Ideally, I'd like her to pick the thing up and drag it away by 20 meters. That would make me feel much better. Alrighty, for those of you who've been watching, on for those of you who've been watching on uh, this little unscheduled broadcast on social media, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to stay here. If you want to continue finding out what's going on here, just go to YouTube 
Google, Google Safari Live, you'll find a platform to watch our twice daily safaris. I'm not out here alone. Steve is also out looking for leopards on foot. Uh, Taylor's out with elephants at a water hole not too far from here. Uh, otherwise, just watch your notifications uh, for when we're next live. us. Now familiar, well I suppose I'll nearly say familiar faces, I don't know any of your faces, but anyway, you know what I mean. What a thing to see. See how she keeps looking this way. Now, this morning, I don't know if you were watching, but Herbert and I managed to find her, and we were on a termite mount. I'll carry on telling about this a little now, in a little bit, uh, Steve's got an update on Hokumori. Well, 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 what an amazingly eventful afternoon this is turning out to be. We could hear the commotion from where we are, and how exciting is that? Well, there we go, Scott and Nikki, wherever you are, leopards do kill Nyala bulls. I was, have not seen it before. He's a youngster, though. But how do I beat that now? Walking through the bush? How do we come back to a bushwalk segment and be like, we're going to top leopard killing in Yala? Anyway, what we're going to do is I found a little bit of elephant dung. But uh, we just jumped onto a little bit of the, the, the YouTube stream there to have a listen to James. And how excited did he sound? Now, isn't it marvelous? Because a lot of you who watched that elephant sighting with me the other day down at Chilter Dam, you said you could hear it in my voice how excited I was. Listen to James in that sighting. These are special things that we see, and we still get excited about it. It's always magnificent. And that, to see a female leopard killing a big nyala, it's very, very cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cleanse. Hobie's going to come in. We're all quite safe down here in the river. Come, Herbie. We're going to do a bit of cleansing. And um, elephants are renowned as medicinal plant collectors in the bush. Hello, Herbie. We all love Mr. Herbie here, don't we? He's back from Lee, feeling nice and fresh. And uh, I know that would, that will highlight the show, hey? From Anyala being killed by a leopard to Herbert Gaza. Okay, so anyway, elephants are collectors of medicinal plants. So I've collected some medicinal uh, elephant dung here and I'm going to burn this and to cleanse us down in the drainage line before we move on to our next endeavor. Oh, a little bit of a little bit of lint in there. What won't do. Okay. Burning of elephant dung is well renowned for um if you can smoke it, you can cure any coughs or any headaches you might have. It might sound quite strange that you can cure something by smoking, cure a cough by smoking. It's got quite a quite a strong smell. You see how, how nice and smoky it is, it sends for yourself. Cleanse everybody after that. Just a little bit of um, of elephant smoke. And the elephants are, are collectors of a medicinal plant. They go out there, they feed at will. Or whatever medicinal plants they feel the need to and we've been doing lots of medicinal plants in my talks and they'll feed on them feed on them so you can go and collect these and you can burn them you can inhale them there's a nice smell you can cure headaches you can cough or smoke them to cure any chest complaints they're also very good at keeping away mosquitoes and flies and very nice to cleanse each other so Herbie we're just going to cleanse you he's come back from leave so Herbie needs a little bit of cleansing to get Hello Herbie, everyone's saying hello Herbie. Herbie's being cleansed. Now I'm going to cleanse all of you viewers back home. Just a little bit of sort of traditional cleansing in the, the sort of African traditional way. <laughs> Miss Anomandris, I won't put it in my mouth, don't worry. But uh, this is a very good way of lighting fire. You see how it doesn't even look like it's on fire there, but you can transport a fire from one fire source to another by using elephant dung because it burns very slowly inside and all I need to do is 
and it's going again. Very, very cool, very, very good, and at the same time, it smells marvellous, and um, I'm going to smell like a burnt elephant dung after this, so sorry, everybody back at camp. It's just the way it is. So before we leave and move off without... Um, well, I've got the cleanse you, Sens. Sorry, my friend. Senzo. Senzo on keys, eh? You're not supposed to turn. If you turn, I'm not getting the whole side of you. There we go. Exactly. Ivy, exactly the same sort of concept. Very similar to sage burn. It's about cleansing the, the sort of the energies and the negativity around and whatever sort of negative spirits might be haunting you for the day. Fantastic. But I've chosen this area to do then because it's very sandy. There's not much flammable, fla flammable material. So I can now put it out safely on the ground. You've got to make sure, though, these are nice things to demonstrate for people, but you've got to make sure that it's out. No leaving this area until the fire is completely out, because otherwise we burn down the whole of the Sabi Sands, and then, then what? Not ideal. Not ideal. Okay. Well, we are going to move on from here. We were looking for tracks of Tingana, but obviously we've been thwarted a little bit of that. We're going to carry on in that direction. In the meantime, let's go over to Taylor. Now, we're just driving past Chitwa Lodge. So this is Chitwa in here. We're just sneaking along the fence line because that big herd of elephants we had, they finished drinking and then they crossed the damn wall. So I'm really hoping we're going to be able to live relive um, one of my favorite elephant sightings that I've had which was it must have been about early 2017 so let's see if we can start to see them and basically we've still got a little way to go well the elephants have a little way to go they walked up and there's this big open clearing off to the left uh, or to the right of the Chitwa airstrip and we had these elephants walking in and underneath all the marula trees actually the grass was nice and green the marula trees were filled with leaves and we had the most gorgeous orange golden light and i'd really like to relive a moment like that but it might take a bit of time but so far so good they seem to be going in that direction so i didn't want to get stuck behind them i also didn't want to put any pressure on them as they walk along that narrow wall i mean it's daunting trying to reverse on there imagine all the elephants pushing and shoving on that steep wall and so I thought we'd go the long way around and I know that it's going to pay off in the end as hopefully they'll come towards us we'll be able to put ourselves in a really good position I also haven't really sussed the herd out they seemed relaxed let's see if they're still still very calm just got a little bit of driving to do Ah, I can see them. They're slowly still coming across the dam wall. The dam wall is basically down there. You won't be able to see it. But I can see glimpses every now and then. Some impala. Hello, impala. All right, we're going to carry on. Mr. Ram, would you like to cross the road first? Yes. Off he goes. Bye-bye. I'm chasing after his his girls that have gone into the Tambweti thicket. Now I'm not sure what's actually going on down and around here. I try, I try to be considerate with the animals. It really seems though this is their home and their home and they're kind enough to allow us to view them to some civilian vehicles. They might be working on a pump. I can see red and red and white candy tape. So and perhaps they're going to be building something that could be something that's happening over there, but I'm not really sure, but we're going to let them do their thing. Okay, now I don't want to surprise the elephants as we go through here. Oh, I can see some big grey giants. So they're all walking that way. But we'll get a spot here and then we'll go back around the way we came. Where we should be able to get another view. Actually, I, can't, I could sneak on this road. And they get us a better spot. Yeah, they're taking their time. Elephants like to do that. Sometimes they're in a hurry, sometimes they're not in a hurry. We'll look at these ones just up in front, and then we'll go around and hopefully 
get some cool, some really nice sightings. There we go. Surrounded, absolutely surrounded by the elephants now. Well, not quite. Finally, what we we've been waiting for, oh, the elephant with a very wet face. No one really went in to swim. Now it just looks like they're dressed for winter and they've got their Ugg boots on. You hear all those sounds, all the rustling of the leaves. I love that sound. It's such a peaceful, calming noise. It's not even, you know, it's so... It re that, that sound actually reminds me of elephants. It's not trumpeting and rumbling and things like that, but the sounds of them moving through the vegetation. That's not thunder. That's the rumbling. Very gentle rumble. Heard communicating with one another. Oh, the earthy smells now too. Puma, I concur. It is, it's lovely. It's my favorite thing to do in the whole wide world is to sit and watch elephants. It doesn't matter what they're doing. They could be sleeping elephants, they can be eating elephants, they can be swimming elephants, drinking elephants, playing elephants. Throwing sticks at Taylor elephants, you know, any kind of elephant I enjoy. And then it seems as though we've got two curious fellas. Let's see if they're going to come up and say hello to us. Hello, boys. There's a lot of force. They're going to come and feed right on the tree next to us. I mean, that's only a couple of feet away. <laughs> You should be able to hear that so nicely. What are you going to do? Put your head through there? <laughs> Literally, yes. You are going to put your head right through the cap on the tree. Kim, you commented on the um, the rumbling of the of the elephants. It is a sort of... It's, um, it's an amazing sound. No, don't do that. Don't please don't push that over. Hey, hey. I'm just running back because he wants to break that tree, but if he pushes it towards us, it's okay, boy. I'm moving back. I've just put my foot on the clutch. Just running back so that he can break it, but he doesn't need to break it on my car. <laughs> also our big and big antenna at Chitwa that you can see there now. Were you gonna do that just on purpose? I don't know if he, I mean, there's no need for him to break, snap a huge branch off, but of course we do know the elephants do like to do that in the, the winter months. Let's see. Yeah, show us how big and strong you are. And that is why I moved out of the way. <laughs> I think I could have stayed there and he would have just kept pushing it over. He didn't care that we are, that we're here. Cheeky little boy. I think he's just trying to show us how big and strong he actually is. Yes, I believe you. Oh, he's really gobbling down on this tree. It seems as though tree one, elephant zero. Don't worry, fella, in a couple of years, you would have been able to push that down with absolute ease not quite strong enough to push that whole thing down thank goodness <laughs> remember that one time it must have been when I just started working here just before I started working here but um James had that big elephant bull pull down some branches do you remember that right next to his car as well it was so, it was so great it was really really awesome so you can just hear another vehicle moving around now There's someone else has joined us in the sighting Now you are going to see another vehicle entering off-road for these elephants. We're not going to go off-road. We're just still going to just stay here in our normal spot. For those of you that 
don't know me very well, I don't like to off-road for elephants. I think it's dangerous, but everybody, every guide has got their own um, tactics. So we're just going to stay here and we'll be the ones that are closest to the road. And then, like I said, we'll anticipate their movements. It might take a little while and then we'll wait for them to come up to the next gap. And then I think, I think we could be lucky. I think we could see them moving through that sort of open area where all the big marula trees are. It will be very pretty this afternoon. It will be nice to compare pictures too from uh, the ones that I have where everything is quite green to hopefully we get a similar similar sighting so I can get this sort of golden effect with the yellow grass. Right, well we'll just wait patiently and move around the elephants today. I bet you're all excited to see what Tandy is now up to. Well, Tundi's eating. She's in the thick grass, and I'm afraid this is the only spot that we can be. But that's all right. I mean, she has given us a rather special, special sighting today. I don't want to move. She has relaxed completely. She hasn't done any of her snarling. So clearly, food is helping her calm down and remain pleasant. Yes, as Louise says, uh, she was just a bit hangry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. She was hangry with me this morning as well. When we found her on foot. And she gave us a bit of a rev this morning on foot, which wasn't great. It always is, I mean, it's quite exciting, but it is a... It's a bit of a fail as far as a walk goes because you don't want the animal to react like you like that to you like that. But she came back and ate her scrub hair this morning with Tlalamba, and I suspect at some stage she's going to go and fetch her cub, so that she too can share in the bounty of this magnificent meal. As as Louis says, hangry has actually been proven by science apparently. Let's. Let's keep quiet. No, avoid the city. This Nyala said nothing. She was so shocked that he didn't even get out an alarm. And there weren't any friends of his around, you see. And so there was no one to alarm for, really, and no one else to alarm at his demise. That's a bit sad. We're now going to try and get another vehicle in here. Well, we can't move, so we can't make any space here. Yeah, Taryn definitely should be able to move the kill. She'll just pick it up and, I mean, she'll pick it up, she'll drag it into a thicket. I suspect that's why she gave us that initial snarl, and I suspect quite strongly that if I wasn't parked where I am, she would have dragged it here underneath this kububerry bush. You can see that um, Fergus is pretty much ideally placed uh, for a, a leopard prey of this size, so she could easily bring it down, you know, or she'd drag it across here and place it in the sort of deep shade over here. That's what she'd probably want to do. But there's a lot. Um, of places around here that she could move it. There's a nice gardenia over there, and I suspect that's where she'll take it eventually. Louise just complimenting me on my lens. Thank you, Louise. It's big, isn't it? It's an enormous lens. I haven't taken any pictures of it with it yet that are worth keeping. Louise, of course, told me to get this lens, so she is not jealous at all. What a special sighting this has been. I'll come see you later. I'm just saying goodbye to the other vehicle that's leaving. 
Louise says she is jealous, but not because of my lens, but because I get to sit here and take pictures with it, which of course is extremely valid. The dear ladies in the final control room and the men in the final control room don't get out a great deal. Okay, well, this is a very interesting question to, to ask. And you say, is there a reason she's gone for the rump first? There must be. Um, I think it's the, I actually think it's the easiest part of the, a few reasons. One, it's relatively easy to get through the skin in the hindquarters there. And so it's easy for her to access meat there. Secondly, although it's not the richest meat necessarily, what it means is that she doesn't have to open the belly, which will then attract other predators, because if she cuts open the belly, the stink from it is going to be profound, and that's going to attract uh, scavengers like hyenas, other leopards. Uh, I, I know I, tra I traveled with a leopard once about probably four kilometers. He'd smelt a dead zebra, and so they have a very acute smell, sense of smell. And if there are other leopards around, she could easily attract their attention. So, although I think the organs are probably of more benefit to her from a nutritional point of view, the meat is certainly good, uh, possibly not as good as the organs, but eating from behind like this means that she doesn't open up the abdominal cavity. And the cheetah eat from the behind at the same time, or for the same reasons, not at the same time. Okay, let's go back across and find out what's happening in the water. Well, the anticipating the animal's behavior is working well, well for us, as you can see. I'm um, also happy to announce, of course, that this herd is super relaxed with us being here. They don't seem to be worried one little bit. Walking straight past us. And that's what I wanted. That's really what I wanted, also to get this light. Now, we're not there yet. They seem to be dodging the big areas where the marula trees are. Sorry, that's my hat. I'm just, I'm hugging my steering wheel, but I also have to look what's going on around me because at any point, an elephant's behavior can change. Hello. Young girl just coming up to the, say hello. Not really paying much attention to us. So now, we're basically in a position where we've had elephants funneling path, past us on either side, and I'm not worried, not even a little bit concerned. There's not been one elephant here that has given us any reason whatsoever. Hello, little one. You can come say hello. Curious, thinking about it. You're only, you're only acting big and brave because mom's not too far away. Yeah, yeah, trot along. Typical. Oh, that is just happily feeding. This is honestly one of the most amazing experiences that you can have in your life is to have such a large herd of animals like a group of elephants so relaxed, just very calmly walk past you. Now, that's the back of the lodge that you can see here at Chitwa Chitwa. And then a couple of mongoose running around too. Jason, the animal that we're sitting with at the moment, the elephants, is the, are, are the animals that I can just sit with for hours and hours and hours on end. I mean, it really doesn't get much better than this. Okay, what we're going to do now, I'm going to turn round. We're obviously going to do a bit of loop de loop here. So we'll go back that way and then we'll sneak. We'll have to go into the airstrip now. And then... Hang on. Yeah, let's let's catch them just because I don't want to block these guys' view here. Sheldon's just down there. Sorry, elephant. A young cow. Okay, hold on. We're gonna do a bit of maneuvering. Not too much maneuvering, but just a shortcut. I think it's nice when you can get up in front of the animals. Like I said, give them room. You don't want to block their pathway. But there they were quite happy to just walk straight past us. It was fantastic. I don't even know where I'm going now. I think we're going to come up on the airstrip. They're all just walking through here. Let's see. 
that's going to be the perfect pathway. Coming up here. Sorry, everybody, I must just turn around. Ah, the pizza truck is being set up. That's nice. For the herd of elephants passing by. Philip, I have a confession to make again. Maurice is so excited to go on holiday, he doesn't want to get out of the car. So he's still in the car, he's packed his suitcase, he's ready to go to Cape Town. And I, I tried, I went there the other day and I was like, Maurice, get out of the car. Like, you know, we've still got a week of work and he just, he said no, he's done. He's on holiday a little bit earlier, so he's stuck there. And he's got a new outfit and everything on. I wanted to bring him out to show his new outfit off to his friends. He doesn't seem to be too impressed with that. This is now gorgeous. See, a little bit of dust as well. Being kicked up, I think, because of me, slightly. But then also, sorry, I might just move just a touch. Um, the other thing is that as these elephants are walking on the and through the vegetation, it's quite dry. It's just like sand now. So they'll be kicking up a bit of dust too. And this is what I wanted. And this is exactly what I wanted. Now, if they would just go a little bit further southwest for me, that would be great. You know, if I could direct them. That is ideally what I'd want to happen so that we can just get the most magnificent views. Some very unhappy crowned lapwings. You might be able to hear that. It sounds like a cat meowing, but it's not a cat. Oh, a baby. But now it stopped. Maybe because I mocked it. It's embarrassed now. Now, Tiffany, I actually didn't even count how many elephants there were in this herd, but there were, I would say, more than 20, at least. But, but maybe not quite as big of a herd as what Steve had the other afternoon. I believe he was telling us he almost had like 70 elephants there the other day. And we're going to start seeing that. We're going to see lots of different family groups of elephants meeting up with one another. Not necessarily that they'll, you know, all be a part of the same herd, but typically when sources, uh, resources are a little bit harder to find, so food and water, you will find family groups joining up, I suppose putting their knowledge together, sharing sort of secrets on once where there was water, you know, many years ago, perhaps we can try there, it's not too far away from here, and then they'll all go in that direction together. So I suppose that's really amazing the way that elephants do work together. And um, they'll also be communicating with other elephants within the area. Remember those rumbles can travel over 20 kilometers in distance. So they can find out, you know, they can send out a rumble. The matriarch might ask, you know, send, you know, not quite an SOS, but if anybody asking, you know, for a, uh, what am I going with this? For like, um, what do you call it on Facebook? When you ask for an advice, um, I've forgotten the word. Someone, you know, please feel free for final control. Suggestions? Is that what they called? No one knowing what I'm talking about? When you type in looking for something, somewhere to eat? Is it a suggestion on Facebook? I don't know, but it's basically the equivalent. And then, um, yeah, and they can say, oh, there's water here. This is great. Oh, the grass is so tasty at the moment. Better get here quickly. Or they could say, no, the, the dam is dried up. We've, we've tried to dig, but there was nothing. And then they won't go there, then they'll go somewhere else. I suppose that's why they have to have such a good memory. Is that pretty much all the signs that these animals at the moment show that they're uh, relaxed. The fact that they're eating, that's a big thing. If they were unhappy with us, they would not, they would not be feeding. There'd be a lot of trumpeting. These elephants are fairly quiet. The odd rumble here and there, which again, just communication, probably deciding where they're gonna be going next. And they're flapping them, yes, but I, I suspect it's for the insects. I don't even think it's to try and cool them down today. It's not particularly hot. I mean, I've had a jersey on the whole, the whole drive. So they're very, very calm. Their tails are all relaxed at their sides, you know, not raised away from their bodies. 
heads on, poking up into the air. Just everything about them. Smelling us, though. She obviously knows we have. She's just checking. Those sounds are just so special. Well, this, this could be exciting now that elephant is veering off now. There's a little one. It's like he's pretending not to see us. We're trying to hide away now. Yes, I'm watching you, little elephant. I'm hoping it comes around and says hello. No one has actually come up to say hello to us today, which is surprising. Very surprising. Normally there's always a, at least one elephant that just can't help itself. The youngster chickened out and decided, no, we're too scary. We got an itchy foot. Looks like it's just resting it up at the moment. specific about which leaves they take. Look at that. I love the way that the light catches the elephant's hair as well on their bodies. It's every now and then. So it gives them like a golden glow. golden hair. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Strawberry elephant. Mm. And those colours magical too. Oh well, that's exciting. Seems as though we're not the only ones having luck on this drive. Steve has managed to find a beehive. We have indeed. We came walking through this little drainage depression. And we just heard the characteristic We won't be able to pick it up on the mic that we have. But they're very busy little bees and they have a little bit of a hive inside of a tamburti and there's a dead branch growing off the side of this tree which they seem to have found some really marvellous access to. And really, really healthy bee populations we have in South Africa. They they, they, they breed naturally, they occur naturally, they're all over the place. There's very, very good diversity in genetics, and they do enjoy a, a varied diet. I think the issue we have across the world with a lot of the bee populations is the homogenized di diet that they have, feeding on monocrops, for example. They need to have all sorts of food, just like our elephants here, just like we do. They need to feed on all sorts of different pollens and nectar. They can't just have one plant. And also, when there's pesticides and fertilizers involved, that often can lead to all sorts of genetic and breeding problems. But very, very healthy. The African bee in African sandalwood. Isn't that awesome? It's the first hive I've found now on Juma. And um, David, Sir David Attenborough commented, it was National Bee Day not so long ago, and he said, if you ever find a tired honeybee, um, just put a little bit of sugar in some water nearby and he'll drink that up and hover back to his hive because sometimes they go out and they get so hot so dehydrated and they just struggle to find it back so don't kill them don't spray them they're not out to hurt you they're just solid workers working for the benefit of of the hive very very special indeed Carla, no. African bees are not aggressive. Unless I try and disturb them in any way, they might end up um, trying to sting me. But that's just defense. I think there's this whole thing about the African bee in, in America. I need to do some reading up about it. But it got hybridized with another bee. 
and that made it very, very aggressive. I don't exactly know all the story there, but I've been around bees my whole life in South Africa. I've never had an issue. Yes, I've been stung by a couple, but that's primarily because I've either stood on them or one's landed on my leg and I did one of these and it stung me. But they don't chase you, uh, even though Senzo is standing a little bit away from here. He doesn't like the bees, but I'm standing right underneath. I've got no issue. Obviously, if I, if I started hitting the stick on the tree and causing all sorts of drama for them, they might react to that. But the bees in South Africa have, you know, there's quite a long relationship with, with people in Africa. Uh, people have been harvesting beehives and honey for a very, very long time. And the use of smoke, so just like that elephant dung I had before, if we wanted to access some of the honey here, uh, we could do it sustainably by smoking the bees. As soon as the bees um, sense any smoke, they have a very good protective and defensive mechanism. Smoke calms them down purely because they think something is going to burn, which invariably it is. So instinctively they go back into the hive, they engorge as much honey as they can, and then they swarm and go off to make another another uh, hive somewhere. So uh, that is what smoke does. It causes the bees to move. So you can sustainably harvest um, honey from a beehive with a little bit of smoke. Obviously, you don't want to influence them and make them leave. But a little bit of smoke just calms them down. But that is what happens. They move away for a little bit. But natural cavities in trees are very, very popular for bees. And we have them all over South Africa. It's probably one of the, the biggest growing hobbies in South Africa now. Steve, yes, our bees are active all the time. They are active throughout the year. Uh, in the early mornings in winter, they're a little bit colder. But uh, they are the most important pollinators we have. They are constantly out looking for flowers and nectar from all sorts of plants and flowers. And because they are out and doing it, you know that there are still plants that are flowering and doing their thing throughout the year to provide the bees with their, with their pollen, which then obviously provides the nectar. Uh, they will go through probably quieter periods, I suppose, but as far as I'm aware, bees are constantly busy. And they have no time clock, they earn no wages, and they have no tax. They're just constantly doing their thing. The true workers of the world. For the common good of themselves. Well, fantastic. We heard some alarm calls before, which kind of brought us into this area. As we were leaving sort of the, the Tundi sort of area, we heard alarm calls back towards Gallagher. So we turned, and we came back to see what we can find. And since then, it's been very, very quiet, apart from these bees buzzing above our head, buzzing above. So it's very likely that Tundi came back in this direction and maybe secreted Tlalamba around here somewhere. Hello, Minamu. You want to know the difference between bumblebees and honeybees? Honeybees produce honey, and they are so they have stings. They're in a colony, um, and bumblebees are not necessarily bees. Um, you get a lot of things that people call bumblebees, and I think I'm not 100 percent sure. I mean, you get things that are called wood chafers, which I've always called bumblebees when I was younger. But they actually are they they burrow into wood and they feed on fruit. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure. I mean, the bumblebee itself. A bee and a bumblebee. I need to maybe do some reading. I remember bumblebees as a child. I actually went to a, a crash called bumblebees. So maybe I should know. Maybe they are similar. Mina Moo, you've stumped me. You like that one? Stumped? Anyway, I'm not sure. I, didn't, I thought bumblebee was a completely different thing, but I might be misreading that one. Anyway, we're going to continue on. Go around towards Gallagher Pan. Let's go and see if anything's going on over there. But in the meantime, Taylor is still enjoying her afternoon with her elephant. We are, sorry, we're just repositioning at the moment. The, no aeroplanes want to land. But, I'm just trying to see. It'll be, it will be really nice when the elephants come across and I think they'll kick up a little bit of dirt but then I'll just park like this so that I'm in a spot where this way we'll be able to see everything there we go all stretching up see just as those trees are starting to recover they come through here and they feed on them again you can see that that whole sort of Looks like it once part of it was a marula tree, then there's something else growing there, but that's all old damage from the elephants. They just keep dwarfing those plants. I don't a lot of the times it's it's really tough for for young trees out here. 
We'll see, they'll have nice, tasty leaves, and that's what everybody wants to go for. They don't want to have to spend extra hours feeding and feeding. I suppose all animals want to be as efficient as possible, but sadly, elephants have got their digestive system against them, with them not being able to make the most and be able to digest, you know, almost 80% of what they're feasting upon. It's half of that. So that means that they do need to eat larger quantities of food in order to sustain them. Here's a big mast again, so that's where the dam is on the other side of that, just so you've got your bearings. So you have the airstrip, and then a little bit north of that, and you're where the elephants are, you'll go towards the lodge, and then it's the dam. There we go, this is what I was hoping for. Okay. A couple of birds also moving around. I'm surprised we haven't seen more forktail drongos and things coming and starlings sort of following the elephants as they move through the grass. This would be a perfect opportunity for them to be able to get some food. One or two starlings running around, but not as many as I suspected. Oh, that was very rude of that elephant, hey Sebastian? Yeah, a photo bomb ruining your shot of a starling. <laughs> Right now, the moment you've all been waiting for, of course, is the part where Ntandi collects Tlalamba, and I think James has got that scene. We have, we've got it. There are the two of them together. Much great joy from my side. I haven't spent any time with Tlalamba for a long time. And so I'm very much looking forward now to spending some quality time with them as they feed on that nyala. We will, of course, not be looking at them after dark because movement around there may attract hyenas, which we don't want at all. And as Taxon has just said on the radio, she will not be able to hoist that kill. It's going to be too big for her. I think, Ferg, we should follow the same path we followed. Anyway, the cub just popped out of the little thickets over here, and now they've turned, they greeted each other relatively fondly, not quite as fondly as they used to, I suppose, but that's normal. The cub gets older, and now they're on their way back to supper, after a very meagre breakfast, must be said. The light is just superb. I'm sure those elephants looked beyond gorgeous in this light. I can't see her anymore. She's somewhere around here. She'll just keep going, I think. I don't think we need to worry too much. We'll travel at roughly the speed that they're travelling. Can you see them at all there, folk? Yes, I agree. All of you who are commenting on how big Tlalamba has become, she certainly is growing at a rate of knots. Where are they? You got them? Wait here. We'll wait here for a shot, Fergus. Oh, there they are. Marvellous. It would be quite nice if they came out into that little open spot. And... Yeah, she's not, gonna, not hitting her mark, so. No, she's not hitting her mark. She's very poorly trained as an actress. Mm. Oh, up on the tree there. Little Tlalamba had a little bit of a dart. Yes, I think Louise is correct. She says perhaps I could teach Tlalamba a thing or two about tree climbing. I would have to agree. I'm obviously the world's greatest tree climber. Far better than any leopard. Oh, oh, that's very kind, Louisa. She, she didn't mean tree climbing lessons. She thought I should give her acting lessons. Well, I'm not sure Fergus would agree that I always hit my marks. That's where you say, no, I, you always hit your marks. 
Focus. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes, I can be a little over dramatic. Mmm, you think I'm, I overact, Berg? Berg just says I'm a bit melodramatic. I think that's probably fair. It's, uh, it's just one, you know, it's trying too hard, as it were. You're going to get them in some beautiful light, I think. All right, while we try and find some beautiful light, Taylor's already got beautiful light and beautiful animals. Let's go across to her and we'll try and find some good pictures of these two. We do, we're still here with the elephants. It's hard to leave such a graceful sighting. They're all so calm and we're the only ones here now. We're very spoiled to be enjoying this all by ourselves. See, I don't need to see cats. If I could have a sighting like this every single day on the game drive, that would be perfect. That would be 100%. I would never need to see another leopard in my life, to be honest. You going to wear that as a hat? See, this one also looks seen looking at us. What are you going to do? Are you going to stroll on past? There's been many elephants that have been tempted to come and say hello, but no one has, no one has greeted us. We don't bite. Come and say hello. Come, little elephant. Okay, bye. They've all changed direction about three or four times. So they're going sort of south now, like we wanted them to. Mm, Paula, sure, the biggest herds of elephant I've ever seen were in Zambia, where there were a couple of hundred together at any one time. I was in the Lozambique National Park. Um, I've seen massive herds here. I think I've seen one close to about 150 elephants or so down in the southwestern corner of the Sabi Sand. That was magnificent. It's not a common sight, but you, you, you can indeed see it. Like I said, it was um, it was during during a dry season. <clears throat> I mean, we were talking about it earlier, how often you'll get big herds of animals sort of hanging around one another, all moving together in search of the same thing, safety in numbers, and then, of course, passing all these trade secrets, which is very important. I don't know if that youngster's suckling. Well, it's just standing next to mum. It's a bit difficult to see. And that trunk is definitely working, but they don't suckle with their trunks. They suckle with their mouths. No, now you're using your trunk as a pacifier. There's quite a bit of elasticity in those trunks, as you can see, as it stretched it. Wow. And he said, I'm going to go right hand down. If that's okay, because look at those ones on the airstrip running. No, there's, that's what I was after, the dust. And I think we're going to get it now. If we just do something like this. And watch them all in front of us. Hopefully. Hopefully there's some of them will come out onto the road. And again, all around us, all just feeding slowly, wherever they want, but with the same sort of general direction. Oh, there's such an amazing smell here, too. A malika, a matriarch might take in an orphan. Um, you know, elephants are social enough, it, it would not surprise me. I've never personally seen it where another elephant has uh, adopted another, but I have heard of it happening before. They're super social, so I'm not actually surprised by that at all. When we, when we watch elephants, we clearly see, you know, different emotions that they exhibit. We can see when they're grieving, you can see when they're stressed because there's no food around. You can almost see it when they're excited. You spend enough time with the animals, you can start to figure these things out. That just gently, one foot after the other. She's just taking her time, smelling along the way. She's one of the bigger cows in this group. Please have a dust bar. Please, pretty please have a dust bar. That would be a problem if a aeroplane wanted to land here. As you can see, there's a roadblock. 
There we go. One's tossing a bit of sand. Oh, that's so epic. Like a, it's never ending really. It's not often that you get an opportunity to view animals walking across sort of a, a high rise where they're almost in line with the sky. And we kind of get that. If I just were, if I were to go back about a hundred meters, the tops of those trees would be cut off. And then it looked like the elephants are in the sky. Wonderful. Now we're going to pass the elephant love right back over to Steve because he's got some on foot. Yes, we do. We've got elephants. I'm sorry I'm speaking so quietly. We're going to move up now. We first just need to check wind direction. It's very gentle. It's almost none of just towards us. It's very important with elephants is to make sure that you know what direction the wind is going and scrub it down. It's perfect for that. Okay, so we're just going to walk up this path and get a little bit of cover. Make sure you stay very close with us. Come, Hobie. view of at least one. It's hard to tell. It looks like it might be a young male, but it's not a very big elephant. I haven't seen any others. So if it is a young male, sometimes you can get a little bit closer with young males, but until we're aware and we know 100%, because if it's a breeding herd, you don't want to get too close to breeding herd on foot. Hello Paula, you want to know what the biggest elephant I've ever seen is? Wow, I think his name might be Duke, elephant in the Kruger National Park. And it's hard to tell really, I mean sometimes you see these big males, they're just enormous, but I spent some time up in Malawi in a, a reserve where they were doing a 500 elephant relocation from Lewandi National Park up to Nkota Kota, African National Parks, and every elephant that they caught in that uh, capture for translocation, they picked up with a crane and weighed. And uh, the one was 6.7 thousand kilograms. Now, some people say 6,000 is as big as they get. 6,700 kilograms. That is enormous. Okay, well, we're just going to move to this little clearing over here. Don't hear any other elephant off to the left. Puma, it is a pachyderm extravaganza. We're just going to get a little bit of an open clearing here. The elephant seems to be moving a little bit this way. There we go. How's your view there? Good. The sun setting in the east, in the west. like a young bull. There were signs of some elephants on their way here. It's possible this might be a bull following the breeding herd. But it's very relaxed. Bulls don't worry too much about what's around them. You can get relatively close because nothing really messes with an elephant bull except for another elephant. They're not bothered about predators or anything else like that, whereas females are normally a lot more concerned about the movements of things in and around. Summer, you want to know what I'd do if I accidentally startled? Well, the idea is not to accidentally do anything. Um, we walk out here silently, and you need to be aware of what you're doing. We're always trying to be cognizant of the wind direction. And as you walk, every now and again you stop, and you listen. And elephants make a very characteristic sound when they feed. You can't hear that 
on my microphone, but when we very quiet, we can just hear the, the movement of leaves and branches there. And essentially what you do is you, if you startle the elephant, it's going to be as startled as you are. So you need to stand your ground. I'm just going to move this side. You need to stand your ground. And by no means do you need to will you ever run. But when you're walking on a bushwalk, you always need to know where you've come from. Uh, what escape routes you might have. Is there a termite mound? Is there a fallen tree? Is there somewhere that you can go if something untoward happens up ahead? There. Looks like he's, he's stopped feeding. Very slow movement. Very subtle. And ideally you want to view elephants if you view them on foot. View them and then leave without them even knowing that you were there. That is what a good trails guide does. It's not about getting the best photograph on foot. It's about the experience of knowing we're here on foot with, the, with nature's biggest. Seems to have turned his back on us as we walk in the other direction. Very nice. You know, if you want to get photos of elephants and all these other animals up close, that's what vehicles are for. So you jump on board with James and you go up to see a leopard feeding on something. But to see an elephant up close and personal, on foot, you know, getting any closer than this, it's just, it's not really necessary. Are you going to get a better view if we went closer there? Are we going to influence the animal's behavior? Are we making it unsafe for ourselves? Are we stressing the animal out? And if need be, can we escape safely? And that's what you've always got to be thinking about, respect. Respect. Don't let anyone ever push you into the position where you need to do something that's going to be unethical and affect the animal's behavior. Okay, so that elephant's moved off quite casually. We're going to make a detour back this way. Go back via Gallagher Pan. Very cool. the sun go down any time Lou you're welcome to go back over to James sorry I'm just one second everybody um, the cub's name is Tlalamba Tlalamba that's perfect okay here they come everyone we're back at the carcass I was just having a quick conversation with some guests I can't see her yet, can you? She's not far from here. We've come racing round. Uh, hopefully she will arrive very shortly. Uh, I thought she was much closer than this. We've got her. Okay, so the guests there have got her. They can see her coming. Oh, there she comes over the top of the car there. Very special. Stop advertising. <laughs> okay, she's going to arrive at the carcass now. <laughs> that is amazing, Fergus. I think you should... Are you, are you being paid by that? You've been getting a couple of kickbacks. <laughs> Here she comes. She's at the kill now. Oh, how magic. Look, little thing. Yeah, Jamie, Tlalama would have been weaned off milk around about three months. That's when the weaning starts. And so she'd have been on, on the meat, as it were, for about... Well, I mean, from as early as two months, I'll start eating meat. But she'd have been on an exclusively meat diet probably for the last four months or so. They still try and suckle for a month or two after they've been weaned. But weaning happens very fast. It's, I guess, easier for the mother to provide nutrition through killing rather than through the expensive process of lactation.
is very sweet. Look at that. Well, that's a bit of both, I think. You know, I think it's instinctual planning. So the instinct is to get that carcass under cover where nothing can see it. Do they learn where is a good place to put it and where is a bad place to put it? Yes, I'm sure they do. I'm sure through a process of elimination and through a process of losing kills to vultures and being found out by hyenas and that sort of thing, they learn to hoist and learn to put their kills or secret them under bushes. So I think it's an instinct to hide the kill, but I think it's a learned behavior to master it, if you like. Just like uh, in human beings, or just like, I mean, a little bit like in human beings, the, we are programmed to language. And every, every human being in the world is programmed to learn a language. And what language that is depends on your experience. So it's, I think it's probably quite similar. Every leopard in the world is programmed to hide their kills. Where and how they hide them uh, is probably not defined by their genetics, but rather by their experience and their learning. This is marvellous. Now, Tlalumba, of course, ate a small hare earlier today. I told the kids that were watching earlier it was a rabbit. It's just because it's much easier than to explaining. I mean, I, I accept that the four-year-old might know what a, a rabbit is, a, but a hare, well, the difference between the two have become far too complicated for me to try and explain. The reason I mention that is that she doesn't look particularly ravenous. Mmm, Mike, that tends to be the case, you know. You say you don't think you've ever seen them feeding at the same time before. That's not unusual. In my experience, in fact, it's quite common for one to feed and then the other to feed. And when we were watching Shungile and Hosanna, and for those of you who are new viewers, those were very special leopards that we watched growing up from very young. Uh, they've, one of them since died and one of them has moved off. But they didn't used to feed often together. They would wait. Uh, their mother would eat on her own. Then they would eat on their own. And so sharing is not so much caring in the leopard world. Because if they have, if they learn to share too well, well, I guess they won't eat so well later on in life. Most of the animals out here tend to be fairly selfish about their feeding. They have to be. Clalumba is hiding there. Doesn't want to come out and have her meal. I mean, if I'd prepared a Nyala meal for my child, I'd be very upset. Sorry, Louise, I missed that. What was it? I think hinting that in our camp we have fairly fussy eaters as well. We certainly do. Well, it's getting pretty dark now. And that doesn't mean we have to leave just yet. But the sun has gone, and we won't be here after dark, everybody. We will be leaving. Just because our presence here the, is probably mm, going to or could attract hyenas and other predators. All right, let's head across to Stivova, who must be on his little path home. Uh, he's got the sun to show you. Much, James, we do indeed have the golden orb setting in the west. And a beautiful, beautiful day it has been. And as you all know, with the setting of the sun nears the end of the bushwalk team's participation in the afternoon activity, as there are leopards prowling around, and we will shortly be making our way back to camp. 
We're not far away. Just around by Gallagher Watering Hole. And um, some final words that I found. A beautiful rock in the ground. And you see how very round it is. It's very hard. And it's very flat on the bottom. It's a very characteristic sort of implement. It uses a grinding stone. It goes all the way back to Stone Age sort of technology. Uh, but would have been used not so long ago as well. It could be anywhere from from 250, 800, 400,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago. Someone could have been using this on a flat rock. And you can see how it's been grazed out there for breaking millet, for cracking open marula seeds, for all sorts of things. Just grinding. So that is absolutely fascinating. I'm going to take that back and put it in the tent because uh, it's educational. Um, generally things you find out in the field you should leave them where they are but they're going to be staying on the property he's not going to be leaving going anywhere in anyone's bag in the tent for educational purposes and to show um, the youth of today that technology back in the past was a little archaic a little archaic indeed so from the bushwalk team we're going to be climbing down making our way back to camp it's been a fantastic day from us thanks again Herbie for all of your efforts and Senza, are you going to make it down that termite mound? Okay. We'll have to see. Okay, well, while we just link around on this little game path back, hopefully we don't bump into anything too dangerous. Let's go back to Taylor and see if she's finally left her elephants. We have left our elephants. Can you see the pizza truck? was there all set up waiting for the guests to arrive and I thought they probably don't want to listen to the sound of my voice while they enjoy their pizza and sip on their G&Ts and watch the elephants so we decided to leave and give them a bit of privacy I think we did get a lovely sighting from those elephants and now we're just climbing a little bit I'm gonna pick up the pace because we're chasing the Sun and unfortunately, as lovely as the sun is, the sun has no manners because it waits for nobody. It just does what it wants when it wants. And I'm really, we'll stop up here. I'm hoping to get one of my favorite shots again where we park really high up and we look and see how straight and narrow this uh, road is. The full sort of boundary, it's so stunning. I'm just gonna stop. Next gap. We need some tree effect. Yeah, that's not, not many natural frames going on over there. Here you can just see underneath the marula tree as it just starts to set. That is very, very special. And not a sound. It is so quiet. The only thing I can actually hear is the fan on the car. That's it. Not one bird tweeting, no Franklins, no babblers. Okay, I just heard some doves. <laughs> I heard them. But I can't say I didn't hear anything. And that's gorgeous. Okay, shall we chase the last of the light? I think so. Okay, we're racing now. Not for anything in particular. I'm not Ferrari safariing, but we just, we're gonna keep going. Like I said, I wanna get to the top over here and, and get a view. It's so pretty. Woo, and now as we go down into this little dip, it's chilly. Super, super chilly. Bounce, 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 up we go. So it's a bit of keep an eye out. Let's see if there's anything here. You know, one day, one day there'll be a leopard sitting on one of these termite mounds or some more cheetah or something along those lines will be around here. Okay, we almost, basically, we have to go all the way to the top. I'm trying to see where the point. We've got to get to that point. And then we'll be at the perfect spot. Wait, go, Impala, go. 
those are the animals you've got to be careful for. And that's why you've got to make sure that you look around. Because if I wasn't concentrating and I was going too fast, you can get one of them. And that's what I don't want to do. Oh, Laramo, it's a nice thought to think that the animals sit and observe the sun as it sets every single day going, oh, what a lovely end to another day. However, I doubt it. I, I think that they're probably just going, phew, now it's going to get really tough because the sun's going to go down and then we can't see anything or we can't see as well as we could and we could get eaten. I think that's probably what the animals stress about more rather than watching the sun set. Pre uh, prey species start panicking and the predators start licking their lips. I think that's what actually happens. Okay, we've got one more big climb to do. The sun has now beaten us though and dropped behind the horizon. But like I said, we'll catch it again. We'll definitely get another view. We've just got to get to up to the top before it goes behind the Drakensberg Mountains. Then we're probably not going to see it anymore, as you can imagine. We'll have to climb up onto the top of the Drakensberg Mountains and get to the the other side. I don't know where Tingana is. Actually, I've, I've been obviously been in the east, so I haven't had my radio on much at all. I'm not sure what's happening here in the north. I'll get an update in a minute. I don't think anything else, otherwise, I'm just. Ooh. It's a bit chilly. It's about three or four degrees colder down in these dips than it is when we start climbing again. Okay. Sorry, we went through a known gremlin spot. Okay, we're almost up to the top. Okay. I remember the days when this was Mvula's territory. And we used to see him. He used to be a we used to be the resident dominant male leopard before Tingana came in and took it over. Also a nice area to perhaps see Gajima, another male leopard who's on the sort of skittish side. He also passes through here every now and then. And this is sort of when he starts to settle down to. He's very skittish during the day, but at, uh, at night he seems to be a bit more tolerant of the cars. No, we've got one more! You think so? I know, but we need to be on top of that one. No, oh, I'm not, I'm talking to get the Drakensberg Mountains. That's the hill we need to go to. Let's go. Okay, we've got one more and then I'm sure we're there because I'm sure I can start to see the Drakensberg Mountains. It's very hazy. But we're just chasing the sun again. I think we could get another view of it. Little Dacre in the road. Run, Dacre, run! We're coming! It did run, it's gone now. Chasing the sun. How great is that? But we will eventually get to the Drakensberg Mountains. Like I said, we've, we've just been driving from far, far away. And it's an exceptionally long road. We'll keep going. We're not going to stop unless there's a leopard or a lion. Something exceptional. Okay, well, we'll keep chasing the sun and hopefully get the view I want to show you. In the meantime, let's go back to a James, who I'm sure is very chuffed with his find this afternoon. I'm so chuffed with my sighting, very chuffed. The leopard is approaching the kill, the cub leopard is approaching the kill. Very gingerly, must be said. Isn't she just dear? She's very dear. I think Tandy just growled at her actually. Now still, she has not opened the abdominal cavity in which the nutrition of the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, if she can get through the ribs. I suppose that's the thoracic cavity, but the, you know, what I mean, the stomach, gallbladder, pancreas, all those d spleen, delicious things. Oh, 
which I think is purely a function of the fact that she does not want to attract anything in the way of scavengers. Yeah, she's trying to approach, but you can see she's quite nervous. She had a, she, the whole time you've been gone chasing the sun with Taylor, she's been asleep. She just got up now. And it made me think that she wasn't actually very hungry, but I'm not sure that that's true. I'm increasingly suspicious that she's just nervous of her mum, actually. Nervous of trying to eat with her mother. I would be terrified of trying to eat with Tundi. She's not exactly um, friendly. Well, I have to agree, Miss Anamandris. She does look so mischievous. That is, of course, why her name is mischievous in Shangan. Which means the playful or mischievous one. Mm, she's looking hungry now. Seems like she's missing out. There we go. Building up the courage to approach her mother. I'm thankful that I've never had to approach my mother in the same manner. My mother has never been quite as vicious as Tandy. Well, on occasion, but not very, very seldom. Now she's kind of pretending that she isn't approaching. But she is definitely trying to approach. Come on, little girl, be brave. Oh, that's too sweet. Look at that. Look at the colours. Isn't that beautiful? I'm assuming you've pushed the record button, Fergus. The reason I'm asking that is because I'm holding my breath. Because if I breathe, the vehicle will move. Oh, look at this. This is very special. Now she, with no experience at all, look at that. She's gone straight for the belly. So she's got no experience of where to go when you don't want to attract predators. She's going to open the abdominal character of her cavity if her mother doesn't move. Mother giving her a hiss. Going... <laughs> Let's see if she actually gets through it. This is where, of course, the mother will not instruct. She's not like she's going to slap her away from the belly. Now she's ready to open the belly herself, maybe to feed Tlalamba. Yes, bit of a growl. Now, a lot of people have mentioned that this is how their interactions are going these days. They're yeah, losing patience. Well, certainly mum's losing patience with her cub. Oh, she's going to play with her tail for a while. Hopefully Mum will open up the carcass for her. That's very sweet. <laughs> I often wonder if it's... Um, and I'm sure I've been asked this. I often wonder if it's harder for little cubs that are born without siblings and they don't have quite the stimulation of ones that do have siblings. They don't have quite the same playtime. And so their learning must inevitably be not quite as fast, I imagine. Well, now, Louise is asking the question, she, did, do you think that... Tandy chewed off the tail intentionally for Tlalamba to play with. Um, I would go with no, but it would, it's not impossible, I suppose. Don't really see why she shouldn't have. 
except that I'm not sure that she's necessarily that thoughtful. And that cub is now having a great play. Now we're going for the belly again. We've still got a bit of light here. I think we've probably got another 10 minutes or so before we'd have to move. She's struggling a little bit there. She's not really, doesn't really know what to do. Tandy's still pulling off the hair. <laughs> You're going to have to do a better job than that, my dear. Pangolin, we think, I mean, look, it's impossible to say exactly, but uh, it's not unusual for a female leopard cub to survive from you know around about a year in fact even before 10 months or so on their own without mum so that's not impossible uh, but between a year and 18 months the separation will start to take place but she could be around for up to two years it really does depend on what territory is available to her now Shadulu of course is off in the west occupying Shadow's old territory. I don't know. To the east is, uh, of course, um, or basically from here to the east is Tandy's territory. And east of that is... Uh, what's her name again? Oh, dear. No, the child's to the south of that. Oh, come on, the old leopard. Sunset Bend females. Granddaughter. Four four spot pattern. And now Salias is long dead. <laughs> no, the one that lives on che cheetah plains. Come on, I mean this is ridiculous. Later with quarantine. There we go. Thank you, Inkanieni. Thank you, Louise. Inkanieni is off to the eastern end of the Kruger. But what's north of Torchwood and into Buffalo's Hook? I don't know. I suspect that's where she's going to have to look. And she might also wedge herself kind of between Shindulu and Tandi. Bella, most female mammals are single mums. That's basically how they live. Some of them are single mums with slightly more social bents than the female leopards, so I don't know what's a good example, warthog. Warthogs will give birth often uh, with another female or so, but you know each warthog is left to raise their own kids. There are no fathers involved. Um, all the cats, female cheetahs the same, lions the exception. Um, you know, there are a lot of single mum mammals in the world. Most of them, in fact, what's interesting though, a lot of them are not um, hugely territorial themselves. You know, so they do, not all animals are, sol not all mammals are solitary like this one is. Like a lot of the predators are, a lot of the cats. But they're not all solitary, and so they do have not so much the help of friends, if you like, but they do have the, um, what was I going to say? They do have the comfort and, of course, the extra eyes to avoid predation that a leopard doesn't have. Well, anyway, we'll sit here for a little bit longer. In the meantime, Taylor's found uh, something that uh, I'm trying to think of something original to say. I've failed. Let's go and see what she's got. It's uh, the animal that's in pyjamas already. I'm envious of these zebras. I almost wore my slippers out on safari today. But how's that one looking at us and the one at the back casually having a scratch? No, the the one behind the trees that you also had in frame. See, they look it's like a rocking horse, but it's actually very itchy. 
And you'll often see from buffalo to zebra to warthogs, rhino, elephants. They're not afraid to wedge a branch between their legs and, and scratch. You can imagine all the ticks that start building up in between their hindquarters, or that skin that's quite thin, and of course it's a nice warm area. So it is perfect for ticks. And also, they don't have hands like us. They can just pick up something to help scratch themselves. I've got those awesome fly swatters, though. Although my ponytail acts like a fly swatter from time to time. It just depends how quickly I whip my head back and forth. It's nice to see the herd of zebra. I think this is the herd of zebra that I was trying to find this morning. Remember I'd said to you I'd seen a whole lot of their tracks. They were just evading us, but eventually we got them. Even though it took a couple of hours. They are such beautiful creatures and it is nice to see them back. Not spending much time on quarantine anymore, the open plains behind camp. Not many of the animals are really spending time there, and I suppose that's just the lack of food. There really isn't too many grass species out on that uh, area. There's a lot of sort of forbs that, and herbs that sort of pop up, and they disappear just as quickly as they arrive. So this is a better suited area, except I think they're on their way north to the Manuleti to go do a bit of grazing. Now, I know how much you all love the FLIR thermal camera, so let's have a little look and see what it looks like. There we go, so you can see they're very, very hot, but very easy to make out, almost unmistake unmistakable. You can clearly see that there is a zebra, and it's been interesting trying to work out the different heat signatures, especially at night. It's particularly difficult trying to figure out what's a scrub hair, what's a, a little crowned lapwing, what's a honey badger dashing through the grass. So slowly but surely we're all learning these shapes, especially when you have a view from above. But you can see their manes are not hot. I like the way that they look. That's awesome here. <laughs> Doing a big yawn at the back. <laughs> Everyone's itchy today. And that little one's having a good old scratch. Wonderful. Right, we're going to go back to our normal view. There we go. Very happy. I don't think we'll see these zebra tomorrow morning. I think they would into another area. Like I said, I think they're going to head north. Probably pass through, pass past Sydney's dam, maybe have a sip of water there, and then carry on with their ventures. Your oh, stripes don't match up, do they? Lots of interesting markings on this one. All oh, just staring at it. They all seem to be scratching. It's so funny. Not a big herd of zebra, though. Maybe a couple more hiding behind the thicket. Now, obviously, the light is starting to fade now, so I know the time is running up to spend with Tandi and Tlalamba. So off you go. Back to them. Well, yes, we've got five minutes left, so we'll just sit here for five minutes and enjoy Tandi and Tlalamba as they share their nyala. Now, I don't know if you've been with us all afternoon, just to give you a little summary of what took place here earlier today. We watched Tandi kill a young nyala bull. I would say weighing in at around about 70 kilograms or so, so almost double her mass. That's why it's out in the open there, a bit heavy for her to move it too far from where it is now. She then fed a little bit from the hindquarters and then went off to fetch little Tlalamba, who is feeding into the left-hand side of your screen there. There she is. Now she's been trying to get into the sort of rich underbelly of the Sniala, but thus far Tandi has refused to open it up for her, so now she's going to re-kill the Nyala 
by swatting it and biting it on the face. There she is, learning and plying her trade. It's very interesting. I don't know what her spot pattern is. See that now she's just playing with her meal. Does anybody know what her spot pattern is yet? Looked almost like there were six spots that side. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there's a unique spot, well it's not that unique, but it's relatively unique spot pattern just above the whisker line. Her mother's 3-3. Three, three. There we go, now she's opening the belly. She's using her carnassial teeth, which are the cutting molars, to sort of slice it open. There we go, there we go. Here it comes. Ferg, you know what? Let me just sneak very slightly forward. I think you'll get a slightly better view just before we leave. Sorry about the scraping. How's that, Ferg? All right. Thank you, Kia. You say Tlalamba has a 5-5 five, five spot pattern. That's quite nice, because just about all the leopards we've had born and visiting us for the last little while have been 3-3. Three, three. Look at those vicious little claws. Yes, now you can see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yes, very similar to her father, of course, who was also 5-5. Five, five. Look at that. She's trying to eat the lip off the nyala, which I can't believe is the best thing to be doing. Ooh, really? Of all the things to eat, little, little leopard. The claws are quite something. She's practicing there the sort of choke hold over the muzzle. Let's just see quickly if Tundi's opened it up. Not quite. She's still cutting away, sawing away at the hard skin. Uh, she's just about got it open. In there is the real nutrition. There we go. You heard it pop. Did you hear it pop? It went... Doop. No, Siddharth, she's not going to hoist this. It's too big. It's too big. So you heard the little popping sound. That was the popping of the abdominal cavity. Poor little kudu, at least poor little nyala. There we go. Now she doesn't want to do is pop the stomach because then there will be enough. All right, everybody, I'm afraid as the stomach gets opened up, the chances of attracting scavengers becomes higher and higher so we're going to leave alrighty what an unbelievable afternoon we've had utterly spectacular hugely grateful to our lady Tundi there and we'll pull out now wasn't that special alrighty as we get out of here negotiate these bushes let's go across to young Mackety Sounds like you all had an exceptional sighting with Tandy this evening, so that's good. we have just got some Impala hopping across the road. Sorry, Impala, we're going to squeeze on through. Now, almost getting time where the lights are actually making a difference now, so I think we can bring the spotlight out. Untangle that. What are we going to find this evening? <laughs> Hello my dear friend Tesla I keep forgetting that you're 8 years old now I keep wanting to go Tesla who is only 7 years old But she's not because she had her birthday On the 14th of June And um, it was the 14th eh? Yeah I think it was the 14th 
Yes, Maurice can most certainly go on holiday with you to Colorado and come and visit you. But uh, first, first he needs to go and visit Cape Town. He has, hasn't been to many other South African cities, so he needs to start traveling a little bit more. But uh, yes, you can definitely add that to his list. Maybe when he's a bit older, though, he's a bit young to be traveling by himself. Maybe I'll just have to come with him. Hey, Tesla, how, how good would that be? As if I could also come with Maurice and come and say hello to you. That would be amazing. Are you happy you got to see a zebra? I'm sure you are. Tesla loves to see the zebra. Now, right, I don't know where we're going to go yet. I haven't quite decided. I think we might go via Impala Plains. Seems to be my preferred area to drive at the moment. I find myself in this area on every single game drive. <laughs> Just coming to have a little look, look around. We know that this is the cheetah favorite area. Although, I don't think the cheetah on the side, I think that they're still down in the west. I haven't really got many updates about them. Last time I heard is that they were on Arethusa airstrip. I think they caught themselves something. Nah, Zach, I, I know it's been a great drive this afternoon, but I'm going to be Debbie Downer. I, I don't think it's going to be the night that we see a pangolin. As much as I'd love it to be, um, maybe, but I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to see a pangolin in this area. I think one day when I go to the Kalahari, I'm going to see 5 million pangolins. Maybe not 5 million pangolins, because I don't think there's 5 million pangolins left. But, uh, definitely not that many left so I'm going to keep searching for them you never know possibly I mean you definitely see them out in the open in an area like this it'd be easy to spot them but again if they were just off off the road where the grass was 30 centimeters tall they could conceal themselves very easily but of course that's one of the very many creatures that we are looking for I'd still like to see porcupine Aardvark, still have not seen any since I've been up here in the northern Sabi Sands. Seen a honey badger, seen a caracal, seen the serval. Have not seen an African wildcat since being up here in the north. Have not seen, what else? Oh, I've seen lots of genets. Have I seen a civet since I've been here? I can't remember. I don't know if I've seen a civet since. I don't think so. Robert, yeah, I think we'll probably have more luck seeing honey badger than a pangolin. But listen, again, I'd so happily eat my words if I could see a, a, a pangolin. I'd very much apologize to nature and say how wrong I was, but until then, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to see one. I don't know. I feel, I feel like there's only a few around. I, I mean, they're not very common. And... I don't know, I haven't seen any tracks. I haven't seen any sort of obvious signs of them. There's one that lives on Simbambili. They've got one that side, but unfortunately we can't drive there. And then they sometimes see one on vessels as well. No, I want to know though, I know you're all saying Maurice can come and visit, but the deal is, is that Maurice can't travel by himself because he's too young, so he needs a guardian, so I will have to accompany him on all these glamorous, the, these glamorous holidays that you're all offering Maurice, so hopefully I'm part of the package. <laughs> we come as a package, deal, I'll handcuff myself to Maurice and then that way I have to go with, and then I'll throw the keys away. Can you imagine? That would be very nice. Now I'm excited to to take Maurice on another adventure. I will take him out this time. He will come everywhere with me, I promise. What's that? I think that's an old stumpy over there. The snake would be really cool. I'm still waiting to see another pup adder. I haven't seen one since we've been since I've been back, since in Kenya. And we saw so many last year. Seen all the Wormslung, which is awesome too. I mean, obviously now they're not going to be sort of as many sighting. Maybe now in the evening, sitting on the roads, trying to warm up. Maybe that's what we will find. 
but we'll keep scanning. Of course, we're always looking for the, you know, the usual, the genets, the uh, bush babies, chameleon, if one wants to be seen, one's brave enough to come out and endure the cold. Again, though, I think we're going to be seeing too many reptiles. Okay, but this is like one of my favorite roads to drive at night, though. This is where I've seen snakes. We've seen the genets or the little kittens. But maybe we see them again. But we'll keep our eyes open, I promise. And we'll call you back if we do see any one of those exciting nocturnal critters. Perhaps James and I need to have a little competition to spice things up and see who can find an owl first. Okay, we'll see who can find an owl first. I'll do my best to find an owl. While you look at the moon there, let me make an owl noise and try and attract an owl. from an owl, no response. Alas and alack. All right, shall we carry on focus to find this owl? Beautiful full moon, that. All righty, on we go. It was very gorgeous, as Louise says, very gorgeous. An owl, an owl, my Land Rover for an owl. That was pathetic. I apologise profusely. Oh, apparently that the the moon is a waxing gibbous, not a full moon, and it will be a full moon tomorrow. A waxing gibbous. Waxing gibbous, eh? I'm glad, or well, I hope no one's ever called me a waxing gibbous before. No, it's not an astrological term, that is definitely for sure. Will you uh, kindly turn on the infrared light there, Fergus? There are some elephants to our left. I think they're going to pop out in the clearings over here. Alrighty, here we go. Elephant coming up. Waxing gibbous. Oh, waxing gibbous you. They're going to pop out on the road. I'm just going to drive a little bit forward. Louise, I don't think that you should take it quite so personally. She says she's never going to help me again because I'm making fun of the term waxing gibbous. I'm actually just rather ashamed that I didn't know. Well, I don't think it was a real threat, Louise. A play-play threat, you know, like siblings play-play threat each other. It was definitely a bruised ego. I'd forgotten what a gibbous was. In fact, I'd heard the term and didn't know what it was. Yes, Louise, I acknowledge you know where I live. That is an elephant, in case anyone's wondering. This is part of a small herd, very relaxed. And of course they are much relaxed in the evening if you don't shine a white light on them. So there's no artificial light on that animal. Well, there is a whole lot of infrared light on it. But there's no white light, there's no visible light. So this very clever camera is making an image from the infrared light being reflected off the elephant. Just see the light shining in its eyes there. It won't see that. It'll just see a very dull red glow on the back of the car.
I haven't spent time with the elephants for a while, actually. Shamsan, that's a really nice question. Well, it's nice because I like the subject. You say, do elephants have wrists and ankles or they're pretty much the same thing? All mammals, and in fact quite a lot of birds and reptiles, have very similar bones to the ones that you've got. They're just modified for different purposes. Now, if you look at the front leg of an elephant, naturally this elephant is now uh, not allowing us to look at its front leg, let me sneak forward. Shamsan, what you would call the knee, or what looks like the knee on the front leg of the elephant, is in fact its wrist joint. There we go. And you see it there? It may have given it a little bit of a fright. Let's just wait there. It's really not a great shot. So Shamsan, yes, they have wrists. It what looks like the knee on the front and ankles they'll have on the back. So the joint you're looking at there, there is the ankle. You can see the, the actual knee is up there just as the leg meets the abdomen. That's where the knee joint is. So underneath that is the tibia, which of course is the sort of calf bone, if you like. And then beneath that will be the ankle. And obviously it doesn't have long foot bones like ours. And those are all much shortened. And then it's digits. I think it's got, if it doesn't have all the same digits as we do, so tarsals, um, it'll certainly have uh, shortened versions of them. Now if we can show you the front leg quite interesting. So what you should do, uh, Shamsan, because I'm not explaining it probably particularly well, but also because you can't see the actual elephant, just Google elephant skeleton and then Google um, human skeleton and just get a simple version. You obviously don't want every single bone, but you'll see that every bone uh, in our bodies just about has a, an obvious, um, or not, not so obvious, but has a, a mirror in the elephant and in the lion and in a cheetah and a warthog. They're all just slightly redesigned for purpose. So the ankle joint on Tandi, for example, uh, extends much further back on the back leg. On a horse as well, or on a uh, or any antelope, that ankle joint extends much further up along the leg. I always find that fascinating because I also used to call, you know, the wrist joint the knee when it isn't the knee at all, it is the wrist. So you've got some nice sounds, I believe, of the elephant feeding, which is marvellous. Of course, elephants feeding in the winter very different sounds from elephants feeding in the summer because of course they're having a go at all of the trees and branches and that sort of thing as opposed to just pulling up the gentle pulling of grass if you like whick, whick. No, Cindy, it doesn't mean that. You say it's a really good question. You say, Cindy, in Tennessee, does that mean that all, <laughs> all mammals have two arms and two legs? No, all mammals have got four limbs. We just happen to call our front limbs arms because ours, unusually, uh, in the mammal world, are purposed for what they are. Uh, the four limbs of a bat are called wings. So we've all got four limbs. But only some of us have got arms, and some of us have got wings, and some of us have got four legs. I think the definition of legs is that you have to actually stand on it. A rather large elephant coming our way, Fergus. Coming to investigate us, I think. A 
I just need to get on the radio quickly. Yeah, the Tandy lock is negative lock, made so by a taxon. The elephant in front, Ferg. Right there. Fairly large one. There she is. Just giving us a little bit of a head shake because she's got a little baby behind her. That's beautiful. Baby has absolutely no concern about us whatsoever. Looking for friends. Let's see if there's another little one in there. A little auntie, perhaps, or a sibling. Wait for me. Let's play. I'm tired of eating, 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 eating all day long. That's probably going to have a little lie down in the dirt now. Come on, give us a little lie down. I'm trying to think of other examples. I mean, sort of not of looking at other animals. I don't think those were bats. Well, they, they were bats, actually. I can see them now. They nearly attacked me. Yes, we've got bats. Okay, so we've got two winged, two-legged bats, four-legged elephants, and two-armed and two-legged human beings. So I was just trying to think of some other examples of the bones and how they are similar in all mammals, but it's much easier if you're actually looking at the animal to see. It's also much easier if you have learnt the names of the different bones, which I have tried to do, but so far failed. Now I must continue to look for owls. We haven't had any luck. I haven't even seen one owl flying away from us yet. Uh, I don't know if James or I are going to be able to even partake in this competition we don't have any owls but we're driving really slowly and i'm checking every little shrub if i was an owl that i'd sit on waiting to catch something but no let me just check here in these trees where are you guys some nights they're everywhere other nights they're nowhere Romit, you know, I'm only good at guessing breakfast. I'm, I have no idea what's uh, for dinner. I, I was in the kitchen at one point, though, and Amanda was preparing. So I know one of the dishes is going to be chicken wings. So everyone's going to be getting their hands and faces filthy tonight. Maybe we'll have a wing eating competition. Um, so, so that's one of the things. However, I have no idea what else. Amanda always surprises us. She's very talented. Oh, no, it's not even a... I think it's not Amanda. It's happiness. Happiness is back. Amanda has gone on leave, so I don't know what is going to be prepared for. You see, this is throwing, throwing a whole different curveball now because now the style of cooking is going to change. I'm going to have to get into happiness's mind and try and think what she uh, what she's going to prepare for us. This is a really nice area, so I'm just putting my hand like that to stop the uh, uh, the glare from the light. So normally, you would find them in areas like this. This is a Tamboti thicket. This is a great spot. But I can't see one thing. Nothing. Okay, off we go. And continue the search. I'm trying to think where we're going to find ourselves an owl. I mean, if we're not winning here, I might have to try a different area, try an open area. This is another good spot to see a civet. Often hanging around here, or a honey badger even, coming up from out of the drainage lines. I just don't want to take my eyes off of the trees. <coughs> Excuse me, not even a little bit. 
Maybe it's too early for the hours. If we um if we can make it back to camp in time, we can always have a quick scratch around for the Scops Isles, but I'm a little bit away. We'll see, because they've been calling most nights here. Oh, I see eyes, I see eyes. Off to the uh Bush babies, bush babies, bush baby. Two. Straight ahead. Go up a little bit. There, there's one. I'm going to keep my light on it. So there's one bush baby, and you can see it's looking down off to the right. That's because there's another one there. Actually, Seb, can we go down and to the right quickly while it's sitting there? Oh, it's just jumped. There we go. And all they're together. Hello. Ooh. Grooming. I don't think I've ever seen bush babies groom one another. Do you want to go in for it? Final control, you're ready. The boss has spoken. There we go. We'll just go into him for it anyway. We didn't get a response. <laughs> there we go. See, if I take my light off, we can't see anything. Infrared lights are not working. Okay, let's not, let's take it out of infrared then and just do normal color. Sorry, everybody. Uh, there's an issue with our infrared lights. They're not actually turning on at all. So we're just using a camera infrared. Then we might as well uh, just view them in color. Also, nocturnal creatures, they don't mind the light so much. That's awesome. Giving one another a good clean by the look of it. I don't think I've ever seen them mellow grooming one another before. I don't know if this is a male and female. I mean, typically you see them on their own bouncing around or sometimes you see mom and youngster bounding from tree to tree we had that amazing sighting where i learned how a bush baby carries its youngster its infant that's what you call a young bush baby and how it bites it not on the scruff of the neck but in the middle of the back just about gently obviously probably by the skin and then leaps it's like as if it was carrying a handbag a purse and then they bounce from tree to tree That's so cool. Look how relaxed they are. This is amazing. Having a real good old groom. And of course they could be covered in ticks and some kinds of mites and things like that. And I I wonder if there's a specific kind of a, a mite or a tick that lives on the uh, on the uh, bush baby. We have to ask our friend Dr. Owen Davies if he's maybe read any research papers about sort of host-specific parasites. You know, maybe even internally, they've got something that just lives on them. Oh, that's really, really very sweet. Ah, I'll have to tweet him. Maybe he doesn't think that he's watching. He hasn't seen I'll tweet him a bit later to find out. It'll be interesting to sort of know. Should we put them in thermal? What do you think it would look like in thermal? Can we? Okay, Seb is just quickly going to man the flare camera yeah, are you on thermal i haven't got a picture uh -uh. no our picture is now gone on the thermal camera oh there it came back for two seconds how about now lou yeah i've got it back so that okay Can you see them? Okay, there we go. We're going to go into thermal now, to the FLIR. Um, a little of the ones straight, straight ahead. I'm trying to see if I can see them. Um, what can you... Yeah, there, yeah, there we go. There they are. It's difficult though. Obviously the tree is still holding a lot of heat from the day, but it is a bit difficult, very difficult to focus. But those little things moving around over there, those are in fact the lesser galagos. You can see them bouncing quite nicely. It'll be easy to follow them. A couple of moths here and there also flying across the screen and you pick up their heat signature. That is so fascinating. They're so busy. We're very spoiled. Normally they're bouncing around and you only get a view for about two seconds or so. 
That's amazing. Long tails too. What's that one doing? Oh, that's its tail. Never mind. I go. I was like, what is it eating? It wasn't. It was just having a scratch. Okay. Okay. Bouncing up. Slowly, slowly, climbing higher and higher. It is very cool to see them bounce around in uh, the Fleer Thermal. Wow. Right, we're going to get back into normal mode now. I'm going to use my spotlight again. There we go. And they're still there. One has climbed, a, one's climbed up top. I can't see the other one anymore. I think we might have to repo. Oh, there we go. There it is. I can see it's ice run again somewhere in there. There we go, just to the left. And the other one's gone all the way to the top of the tree. We can't actually even see it anymore. This one has still got a little bit of a niche. Well, we were lucky to end up seeing the bush babies. I didn't think we were. Starting to scurry up the tree now. Hopefully they'll grab a couple of moths from the air tonight. There are plenty of them around. But thank you for joining us. It was a very exciting safari. And we'll see you all tomorrow morning.